So I've been asked uh, by a good friend today to speak about residential schools with all of you. Um, it's been a really, couple, really, really happy couple months for Native folks. I had a lot of family who went to residential schools. My grandpa went. Um, and just the, the content morning, there's a lot of violence, a lot of systemic, horrible stuff and different pa uh, facets of genocide in this. to St. Michael's Residential School and there it was full-time school until you're in grade three and then it was half work and half school. The majority of my grandpa's friends committed suicide within two years of graduating. He always hated washing carrots because throughout the winters your hands would freeze. Um, one of the wardens on the farm beat the students with a flashlight every day. My uncle's friend's friend was a chronic bedwetter and he was whipped and beaten every time he wet the bed. They locked the schools after mid uh, they locked the bathrooms after midnight, so children had no access to the bathrooms, and that student had no other option. Um, the federal government confirmed that there was six thousand plus students that had died in the schools. As of 2021, 3,200 of their identities had been confirmed. And with this recent uncovering of all these mass graves that had come up, I think at least seven or eight different schools have been investigated so far, and there's over 1,500 students. Skeletons that have been found just those seven schools out of the 139 that are here. So there's estimates varying saying that the, you know there might be up to 30,000 students that actually died from these schools. And now that's a ridiculously violent number and a lot of people across Canada are going to, into denial about this. And a lot of them are saying that these children just died from tuberculosis. Now this reveals their ignorance and it is nothing more than a racist excuse. It wasn't a bullet that killed Anne Frank. It wasn't a gas chamber. It was typhus. It is characteristic tactic of fascism to subject their victims to conditions that are antithetical to life. This tactic of systemically putting people in, in conditions where disease flourishes is used today by the United States. The ICE facilities are using this tactic as we speak. Based on the recommendations of the Davin Report, that Canadian British devil John A. Macdonald authorized the creation of a residential school system in 1880. It was designed to isolate the indigenous children from their families and cut all ties to their culture. The widespread understanding of these schools was deliberately to kill the Indian and the child. After visiting 35 residential schools, Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce, Chief Medical Officer for Canada's Department of Indian and Interior Affairs from 1904 to 1921, reveals that Indian children were dying at alarming rates, with a mortality rate of enrolled students as high as 25%. This number climbs to 69% once the students leave school. Now it is important to note that while residential schools were created in 1880, this concept has been here for much longer. For more than 200 years, from the early 1600s to the 1800s, religious orders run mission schools for indigenous children. These were the precursors to the government of Canada's residential school system. This is important to know because we can see that institutionalized violence towards indigenous children is older than this country as it exists today. It is important to know this because it helps us understand the conditions today and the continuity of the residential school system with what we have today called child and family services. The colonial violence from residential schools has c continued uninterrupted. Today, indigenous kids are 7.7 .7 of the population, yet they, can, they, yet they, comp they comprise 52% of the kids in foster care. MCFD has taken more kids today than residential schools have in their prime. Colonialism has never ended here, and Canada upholds it very tenaciously everywhere else. Canada has inflicted colonial violence, resource robbery, and regime change against Bolivia, Haiti, the Congo, the Dominican Republic, Greece, huge chunks of southern Macedonia, Venezuela, Papua New Guinea, Guatemala, Ecuador, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Chile, and many more. For indigenous people, fascism has been here for a long time. 
Most Canadians have been able to avoid it, but that is becoming less and less the case as things continue, continue to deteriorate across this country. Che Guevara said, it isn't my fault that reality is Marxist. This means that the material conditions matter. Corporations can spend billions of dollars to drown the population in lies, but there comes a time when the material conditions contrast the propaganda too hard for the people to continue believing in it. In 2021, the corporations can no longer beat you over the head with the idea of the American dream. Right now, the empire of white supremacy is a sinking cru luxury cruise ship. Hundreds of millions of people are stuck punching the clock and trying to keep above water while the capitalist class sits on the top deck in the sun, drinking champagne and smoking cigars in stolen opulence. Another thing is la to think about is language. In my language, there is a term for somebody who speaks so much that it is offensive. Even if what they are saying there's nothing wrong with it. It is still offensive to be a windbag. This concept is sorely needed in English. Yes. In, a, in anthropology, there's a huge debate on whether culture or the language to articulate the culture came first. In North America, there's a huge amount of terms to hate on people on welfare and poor people. This is to ingrain and foster the development of classism. I'm sure you can think of many of the, these violent terms but there isn't an equal or greater amount of them to hate the rich and hate the exploiters of our labor, our bodies, and our minds. This is a glaring reflection of the way we have been taught to think. The holes in this patchwork language are lapses in our perception. The ruling class has given us a lot of poisonous words and ideas to perpetuate and not the violence and not the words to heal, to foster solidarity, and to build. We need to take a hard look at where, the, where these colonial tongues are spoken. How far we see English, French, and Spanish spoken across the world is a testament to fascism. Today, there are 29 countries in Africa that speak French, and 15 of these countries' economies are controlled by France. Virtually all of Latin America and South America speak Spanish, and, and has had their governments overthrown by US imperialism something that we benefit from here because we get cheaper products. Fascism is here for indigenous people and has been exported across continents for decades. People praise Scandinavia, Scandinavian countries for their policies, but they are neoliberal hellholes who only sound good because they receive blood money from the exploitive relationship of what we are told to call the third world. Without that exploitation, each of these nations would crumble like a house of cards in a hurricane. As of 2019, there are 197 mining corporations plundering, plundering Latin and South America. There are 94 Canadian mining corporations right now plundering Africa. This country is an imperialist nation. Fascism is here and it landed in 1492. Since then they have enslaved, extorted, genocided, and committed violence of all kinds against indigenous people and done all this to pursue power and profits at our direct expense. Natives like to joke that Canada has three corporations in a trench coat. And I wish it were that simple, but it isn't. Since the Hudson's Bay Company, the mercenaries, the Anglos, the Francos, and all those people declared this country in 1867, they have pillaged left and right. They have stolen the furs, the oil, the copper, the diamonds, the grain, the wheat, the salmon, the bison, the water, the timber, and the land from beneath our feet. They have pillaged even the ecosphere that we use to breathe. A few weeks ago, we saw Lytton burn to the ground. A few years ago, we watched Fort McMurray burn to the ground. Three summers ago, we watched the sky across the lower mainland turn yellow with smoke. There are actually companies here who are, set, who are packaging and selling Canadian air to the other side of the world. We must put a stop to the commodification of our resources. We must put a stop to the commodification of the pieces of our lives. We must put a stop to the commodification of our safety, our time, our health, our environment, our education, and the bonds that we have as humans. We must understand that settler colonialism, fascism, capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy are part of the same beast. 
We must drive a stake through the heart of this beast of relentless and genocidal capitalist expansionism. <coughs> Without a reorientation of our society towards indigenous-led socialism, we will watch in terror as more and more of the working class suffocates. Day in and day out without change, you will watch people driven to the edge of desperation. I want to end this on a happy note. The ruling class has billions in infrastructure. It has the solidarity of, in of ruling classes internationally. It has the police. It has the henchmen. It has those goons. It has the militaries. It has the training. And it has all the funding it could ever need. But what do we have that it doesn't have? We the people have love. We have solidarity. We have the understanding of each other's struggles. Those lab coat eggheads in ivory towers for decades thought that it was opposable thumbs that put humanity at the top of the food chain. But they were wrong. It is our empathy that has made humanity so powerful. When asked what constituted the beginnings of civilization, the anthropologist Margaret Mead said it was a healed femur. The time and effort required to heal each other, she said, demonstrated the first sign of civilization and of compassion. It is our ability to read another. It is our ability to read how another is doing by nothing more than a look, a pained sigh, a tone of voice. These are incredibly small things, but they let us read each other as clear as day, and they allow us to care for each other. This is where we differ. The ruling class, those paper signing murderers, are motivated by numbers and concepts. We the people are motivated by love and our humanity. In Lakota, their term for I love you translates to I, suffer, I would suffer for you. It is a term that cannot be thrown around the way I love you is thrown around in this colonial tongue. As long as we remember that all we have is each other, we, as long as we remember that all we have is each other and we stand shoulder to shoulder, we will be victorious. All my relations. We all